You're listening to... What is this? Uh, come in. Hey, Big. Hey, what's up? Hey, man, I'm sorry I'm late. I... (laughs) It just takes a while to get here. It always takes longer. Everything always takes longer than you think it'll take. Yeah, tell me about it. Hey, what's going on? I thought we were going to record. Oh, was that what we were doing today? You don't even have the the microphone set up. Uh, No, it's it's just a lot of work to set those things up. Well, I know, but you've always been okay to do it in the past. Yeah, I guess. Dude, it's a new year, man. The first time we're getting together in this new year. Let's uh <laughs> let's do this thing. I don't know. I don't know if I want to, man. I'm I've got a lot of stuff to do and it's hard to make time for this. I mean, there's there's stuff I'd rather do than record to for sure. So, I don't know. I'm sick and tired of it. I got I, I want to sleep. To tell you the truth, that's what I'd really rather do. Can I just go to bed? Well, dude, I came all this way. And look, I got a lot of stuff to do. I'm hard. I mean, uh, it's hard for me to do all this stuff, too. Uh, Yeah, sorry, a a Freudian thing there. We'll have announcer man cut that out, or whoever cuts out things. But, you know, I came all this way. Let's let's record. Just maybe you'll get all into it. Do you remember how you used to feel about the show? You used to put hours and hours, like every single day, into the Dune, Steve. Yeah, gosh, sometimes I wish I could have that time back. Uh, Don't think like that, man. Uh, If you think about all the hours you waste on the toilet or asleep or in church you'd blow your brains out hey those hours on the toilet are not wasted okay okay but but just think about a year ago at this time we came back from new media expo we were super psyched and pumped up about doing the show and about doing more shows and about doing better than we had the year before and then it fell all apart but yeah but here we are a new year we can we can start over we can hit the reset button we can go forward and, and this is not a year ago rish it's 2015 it's it's different it shouldn't be it's still you it's still me i i mean dude a year ago you were so into the show that that, that you would write like a song parody for us to do at the very beginning of the show it was inspiring man uh-huh all right, you know what? It's it's a new year, and we're going to do a song. Hit it, guys. <sighs> uh, this isn't going to be easy, by the way. It's probably going to take us an hour and 45 minutes to do the song. Just letting you know. Are we recording? We'll have to start soon. Get this show moving on. I drove out here tonight. I'm glad I came along. I sure hope you're inspired. This is a late night, and you're tired, and we're both not quite awake. But I know pretty soon I will have to go away. And when the Dune Steve is good to go, tonight we're gonna do our best show. Record the Dune Steve. Like a mofo And tonight I'll podcast like an old pro It's the Dune Steve The Dune Steve Tonight we're gonna record the Dune Steve That's right The Dune Steve The Dune Steve yeah. Tonight we're gonna record the Dune Steve Here I am singing Just like Maroon 5 It's a song I don't like But if it means the show will stay alive, I guess I'll rock the mic. It has got so hard to stand here, ignore how you smell. But for our show's fans, I know I would go through hell. And when the Dune Steve is ready to go, tonight I'll really make my blood flow. Podcast the Dune Steve like an old pro. Tonight we're gonna do our best show. The Dune Steve, yeah, the Dune Steve. Tonight we're gonna record the Dune Steve, the Dune Steve, the Dune Steve. Tonight we're gonna record the Dune Steve. Oh. We don't.
don't want this show to stop Because then we'd have to start all over Start all over Maybe the quality's dropped But today that's all behind us All behind us Behind us And when the Dune Steve is good to go Tonight we're gonna do our best show Record the Dune Steve like a mofo And tonight I'll podcast with this old ho And when the Dune Steve is ready to go Tonight I'll really make my blood flow Podcast the Dune Steve with this ball of dough Oh, come on And tonight gonna do our best show the dune steve the dune steve tonight we're gonna record the dune steve the dune steve the dune steve tonight we're gonna record the dune steve the dune steve yeah the dune steve yeah tonight we're gonna record the dune steve the, the Dune Steve, yeah. The, the Dune Steve, yeah. Tonight we're gonna record the Dune Steve. Dune Steve. What? There you go. I wow. The 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 old big came back. I saw him. Excellent. All right. You ready to record, man? Ha. Uh, you know. I got a lot of energy there for doing the song, but... Yes, you did. Then we, we kind of used it all up. I don't know if I, I... I think I really needed to have that nap now. And my throat hurts. I don't, I don't know if I can talk anymore. I think you're right. I'll just... Uh, maybe next week we'll get together. See you later, folks. Good night, man. <laughs> No. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevit. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. My name is Big Anklevit. And I'm Rish Outfield. Well, th- that's not actually my name, but it's just kind of what I go by. Sorry. I didn't mean to lead people astray. Well, I did mean to lead people astray. And my name is Aloysius Van Buren. And uh, you're listening to the Doonstief. First show in the 20... Well, first show we're doing in 2015, right? Yeah, that's true. Uh, We've released a show we did in 2014 in 2015. But this is the first full-on 2015 production. Maybe it'll probably be somewhere around March. Or maybe even May before we get a completely 2015 thing okay now you're depressing me let's just cut all that out and say it's a new year and here we are and we're excited we we can't wait we're raring to go oh hey can you do that line again it just i i i could tell you were just phoning it in there (laughs) it wasn't believable all right, everybody. Welcome to the show. Uh, we are excited, to tell you the truth. I love doing shows. Um, as much as our little skit at the start of the uh, of the show led you to believe otherwise, recording shows is the best part about the, this podcast. And uh, we've got a, a story for you today. The story is called Calamari Stakeout by Austin Malone. Austin Malone, that name's not familiar. Yeah, I, I don't know that we've had his stories on the show before. I think this might be a first-time appearance for him. A fan of the show, obviously, because he this is a another triple-word score story. Oh, you're so. kidding, man. I thought we'd burned through those years ago. <laughs> you wish. I do wish. <laughs> but no, yeah, we still got several left. Oh, um, no. And uh, one of them is by a chump named Rish Outfield, another one by another chump named Big Anklevich, which will be the low point of the uh, triple word score event. But, you know, the low point's still down the line. This one's pretty good. <laughs> okay, well, and um, who produced this for us? Because you can be sure we didn't produce it ourselves. Oh, of course not. No, yeah, this one is produced by producer extraordinaire, the the guy who really has excitement, who every day is going, oh, I can't wait to do stuff for the Dune Steve. His name is Justin Charles. He's my man, my main man. 
Justin. Is he really your main man? Yeah. Oh, my man, Justin. Okay. All right, get a room. Uh, so anyways, yeah, uh, he was our producer today. I'll, I'll give you a quick thing about triple word score. Uh, you get three random words picked out of a hat, and you have to craft a 2,000 word or less story, basically using these words and whatever the heck else you want to come up with for it. The three words are supposed to be important to your story. Whether they, you know, how much that works out depends per story. But uh, yeah, this one's a this one's a good one, I think. Did a pretty good job weaving the words in. Why don't you tell us, Rish Outfield, what Austin's words were? Okay, his three words were squid, fodder, and trap. Okay. Fodder, that's a fun word. We'll have to uh, discuss that on the other side. We've already discussed a little too much before the story started. So we're going to go ahead and head right into that story. And then we'll talk more about it when we get back. Here it is. Calamari Stakeout by Austin Malone. Having a live squid thrust down your trousers is not the worst way to be awakened. Wait. No, that's wrong. Having a live squid thrust down your trousers is absolutely the worst way to be awakened. It ain't even the poor thing's fault. Picture you're a squid. You're out of your element, in a fair bit of distress. What do you want more in the world than to bury yourself in a nice dark hole until the danger's passed? I yelped, leaping from my bunk to perform an impromptu squid extraction. Hendrix, my bunkmate, stood in the doorway laughing just long and loud enough to get my attention. As soon as he had it, he cut the noise, his thick red beard bristling around a frown. He folded his arms, each one as big around as my waist, across his massive chest, and spoke in a low growl. Best get used to it, small fry. This plan of yours don't work, and I'll toss you overboard myself. I snorted. I ain't about to be made squid fodder by the likes of you, Big Red. With that, I pitched the squid at his face. His arm blurred, and I caught the flash of silver. I ignored the pathetically wriggling pieces of squid that fell to the floorboards at his feet, focusing instead upon the curved blade that Hendrix was pointing at me. I'm not kidding, boy, he said. If this runs afoul, I promise I'll live long enough to see you down old Sly's gullet. I sighed. Nothing's gonna run afoul, Hendrix. The knife wavered. You don't know that, Hendrix said, a slight tremble to his voice. This critter kills ships. I shook my head. You got your head on backwards. This time, our ship kills the critter. He reluctantly sheathed the blade. You really that sure of yourself? My plan's solid, I said. Just make sure you and your boys can handle your end of things. His angry scowl came back. You got no call to be doubting me. There ain't a man on my team with less than five whales under his belt. Well then, I said, rising, glad that's settled. You trust me, I trust you. And by tomorrow, we'll be rich and famous. He paused, then nodded, giving me one last squinty-eyed glare before heading up on deck to get his gear together. I stretched and threw on a shirt, stopping to scoop up the squid bits from the floor before descending to the containment tank. The tank was a false hold the Admiral had ordered constructed. Once it was completed, his crew had filled it up with seawater while I took one of his skimmers up and down the coast, gathering the pieces of my secret weapon. Now, at the bottom of the staircase, I grabbed one of the glow tubes from its sconce and shook it. The phosphorescent worms within the brine solution agitated, and a soft pale green radiance illuminated the landing. I stood in a closet-sized alcove, its only feature a large trap door with an oversized iron handle set into the floor. I bent, grunting as I hauled the trap door open, and tossed the squid pieces in, careful not to look directly at the iridescent shimmer that floated on the surface of the water below. One of the whalers, doubting my honesty, had come down here a few weeks back. The hapless bastard had thrown the hatch and looked into the rainbow-hued mass below. Entranced, he'd fallen in, and that was the last we'd heard of him. The demise of one of the whalers was a minor setback to my plan, but a major loss to Hendrix, who'd known the man for many years. This, I reflected, might have something to do with his general hostility toward me. 
That line of thought didn't get a chance to track, though. As I closed the hatch, I heard the clang of the custodial bell from above. Old Sly had been spotted. I dropped the hatch and the glow tube and tore up the stairs. Captain Jess was waiting for me, unimpressed by the threat of the monster. Her sable tresses streamed in the breeze as she glanced in my direction. As soon as my feet hit the deck, she pursed her lips and blew a piercing whistle. Hendrix eased his harpoons to the deck and hustled over. All right, boys. She drawled. Listen up. Whatever differences you might have, set them aside now. I ain't interested in seeing my baby turned into driftwood. We're expecting impact in just under an hour. Be ready in half that time. Her pale green eyes met mine. We'll be taking our cues from you. If you leave us hanging, I guarantee I'll keel haul you from what's left of my ship. Get in line. Hendricks grunted. She fixed Big Red with her gaze, and the whaler wilted. Sorry, Captain, sir. He muttered. I am, ma'am. I mean... Captain Jess let him stew for a beat before speaking again. Everyone to your stations, she said. Dress rehearsal's over. We separated, and I paused at the base of the mainmast to watch Hendricks inspect the assembly of his harpoons. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't afraid of Big Red and his arsenal. The Admiral and I had seen firsthand the devastating impact of those weapons when we'd held auditions on the beach. Hendricks had introduced himself, explained the mechanics of the harpoon, and then proceeded to demonstrate its effectiveness upon a nearby sand dune. We'd been knocked onto our asses by the force of the explosion. After ascertaining that I was still in one piece, I sat up to see Big Red standing at the edge of a smoking crater, smiling smugly. It's these little orbs, he told me later, after about a month at sea. See, our guildmaster fancies himself something of an alchemist. I'd stared into the fist-sized globe he held up. It looked to be made of glass and glowed with a white-hot incandescence that was painful to look at. What's in there? He'd chuckle. (laughs) Only the boss man knows that, and he ain't about to tell. Now, I watched Hendricks load several of the orbs into the hollow shaft of a harpoon, before fitting the multi-pronged blade onto the end. I thought about what one of those could do to a man, and I shuddered. He looked up at that moment and shot me an evil wink. With a shake of my head, I turned my back on him to climb into the crow's nest. I greeted the lookout, Rook, as I clambered through the trap door into the giant basket. You got a fix on old Sly? I asked. Without a word, he extended a leathery brown arm to point dead ahead. I followed the line of his finger, taking in the sight. There on the horizon were the twin sisters Sidar and Phaestia, volcanic peaks that marked the entrance to the trench. Any ship that passed the twins would have open sailing to the western continent, trimming about eight months off any voyage. Trouble was, old Sly took umbrage at trespassers and thought sailors made just about the tastiest meal ever. There weren't many accounts from survivors, but from what I could gather, he liked to swim up under a ship, rip its hull open with his beak, and guide it to fetch up on the unforgiving surface of the volcanic range. The jagged rocks offered no sanctuary to the hapless seamen, and old Sly could feed at his leisure, plucking sailors from the wreckage like fruit from a tree. As we neared, I could just make out the broken hulls and twisted masts left behind by the poor fools who'd gone before us, strewn about the edges of the western passage like discarded toys. And there, about halfway between the twins and our ship, was the telltale frothing swell that marked Old Sly's presence. He was still far enough away that I couldn't really appreciate the threat he posed. I was able to think, instead, about my share of the shipwreck salvage. Then Old Sly submerged, disappearing from view. To my credit, I only panicked for about five seconds before signaling Rook to sound the first alarm. He gave the bell two solid whacks, scrambling the crew to finish preparations. Leaning over the edge of the crow's nest, I watched the whalers loading their gear and themselves into the lifeboats at the ship's stern. The trap was set. But for the first time, I entertained misgivings about the sanity of positioning ourselves as bait. I whipped out my spyglass, using it to scrutinize the water off the ship's bow. 
The instant I saw the shadow of Olsly's bulk beneath the waves, I barked an inarticulate yell at Rook. A second later, the bell clanged. I dropped to the floor, clutching at what little purchase the crow's nest offered. And I'd just begun forming the words of a prayer when the impact came. A crazy seesawing of the crow's nest accompanied a grinding sound from below. That'd be old Sly ripping through the hull. A distant part of my brain in And I held on for dear life to keep from being flung out into the open ocean. A minute later, the gut-wrenching sensation ceased. I gave it a full count of ten before rising, just to be certain. Sure enough, old Sly had been incapacitated by my own custom-made sea monster. I could make out the giant squid's tentacles, each one three times as long as our ship, floating limp in the waters off our bow. I could also see the rainbow-hued shimmer of the symbio kanji just starting to peek out from under the ship's edges. The symbio kanji jellyfish were the scourge of the coast. Individually, they were the size of my thumbnail each one packing enough venom to paralyze a man for up to three agonizing days. But, get more than one of them together in the same place, and they'd merge, forming a colonial organism that packed a wallop in proportion to the number of jellies that had been incorporated. It had taken me a solid month to painstakingly gather samples from the larger colonies up and down the coast and transfer them to the ship's hold. The ship shuddered as it scraped over old Sly's supine bulk, and I white-knuckled the rim of the basket, peering over the edge to watch the giant's head appear from beneath the stern. A baleful eye, bigger around than the crow's nest in which I crouched, emerged. It seemed to be glaring straight at me, and my bowels rolled. Then a metallic streak the relative size of a toothpick flew across the squid's mantle to bury itself in the hideous orb. With a sharp crack, the eye exploded in a gout of seawater and black ichor. Big Red's team weaved their tiny boats in tight loops like clockwork cogs, reducing old Sly's head to pulp in short order. We'd done it. I turned to Rook with a grin, giving him a thumbs up. He sounded the bell and crouched to open the padded bag at his feet. While he withdrew one of Hendrix's orbs, I turned around to look down at the deck. Captain Jess accepted a long-barreled rifle from the first mate and set the stock to her shoulder. She brought her barrel to bear on a point somewhere above my head, adopting a ready stance. I glanced back at Rook, who slipped the orb into a leather sling. His arm whirled and he released the blazing globe into the sky. Captain Jess calmly tracked its course, allowing it to reach its apogee before she pulled the trigger. The sound of the shot was muted by the explosion in the sky above. With ringing ears, I could only stare up at the column of fire that erupted in the air above the ship. They'd definitely see that. I'd lost my spyglass when we ran aground of Old Sly, so I couldn't spot the Admiral's fleet of salvage ships on the horizon, but I knew they were bearing down on our signal as fast as the winds could push them. My exultation suddenly drained. Shit. How the hell was I going to get rid of the symbio kanji before the Admiral's divers arrived? On the deck below, the crew was cheering. everybody welcome back hope you enjoyed that story oh you needed a comment on as to whether i enjoyed it or not no i just i figured i'd break it up you know make it more bantery like you say something then i say something doesn't have to be that way you know oh thank goodness i'll just keep talking anyways what we usually do after the story is the, the feedback cast list. oh the whole cast list so yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of cast in this story, which that's a relatively common thing with these uh, triple word score stories because you don't get a lot of words. Um, but uh, but yeah, the main character was played by Big Anklevich. I'm not. I don't know if he had a name. I can't remember if he had a name. Call him Ishmael. Okay, we'll call him Ishmael. <laughs> uh, Hendrix was played by Rish Outfield. And uh, the captain of the ship was played by Julie Hoverson. And there you have it. Cast list for Calamari Stakeout. 
Okay, so usually we ask uh, a, a couple of questions. We ask three questions for the triple word score winners. Right. Did we ask Austin those? Yes, we did. And he did respond. Have we ever had somebody not respond? So far, no. But, you know, our, our organization is so sparse and lacking that I'm sure there will come a time where we go to uh, read their answers and we're like, oh, crap. He didn't do any. So we'll see when that comes. That's I'm sure it's still coming. Okay. So question number one. <laughs> uh, do you want to be questioner or answerer? Uh, I'll answer. I'll, I will play the part of Austin Malone. Okay. Question number one. Was this a fun contest for you? Is writing generally fun to do anyway? How did the rules of this contest make it more or less enjoyable for you? This was definitely a fun experience. For me, writing is nearly always fun. And the structure of this contest made it even more so. Question two. You were given three words at random. How much impact did the three words have on the finished product? How did you decide in what way to use the words? The three words I was given played a huge role in the creation of the story. All I had to do was try them out in different combinations. Squid trap versus squid fodder. Hmm. And the opening conflict between Hendrix and Small Fry, oh, that was my name, Small Fry, played like a movie scene in my head. Once it was established that the characters were trying to take down a giant squid, subsequent questions led me through the rest of the story. All right, question number three. Who is your favorite doctor? Well, my favorite doctor goes by the name of Earl, and he works out of his apartment above a tattoo parlor. He is very gentle when attaching the electroshock pads to my skin, and he always gives me a lollipop afterwards. That's very disturbing. (laughs) A little bit, yeah. And when, when he goes to the doctor, does the doctor go, my name is Earl? Ugh, that's a dated reference, man. I know. Millennials aren't going to get that. Oh, yeah. It's so old. It's... <laughs> but that was a good show in its time. I think it kind of went off the rails relatively early on, though. But we're not talking uh, my name is Earl. We're talking calamari. Have you ever eaten calamari before? I have not. For I am a coward. Yeah. Do you ever eat food just so that you can say that you've eaten that food? I have a few times. Like I I ate escargot to be able to say I'd eaten snails and I, you know, ate the neighbor's dog. But that was mostly because it was noisy. Uh Uh-huh. But I... But then you could say that you've eaten dog after that, too. So that's That's a good point. Yeah, it's a shame. (laughs) I I should have thought of that. Uh, But we used to go to this Chinese buffet in uh, L.A., uh, and they always had this big platter of little squid or octopi, whatever those are. And and we would dare one another to eat it, uh, but I I never would because I spent so much money to buy the food, you know, to eat, that I thought if I'm sick, it will ruin it and I will have wasted (laughs) that money. I guess there is that. So there was pragmatism in addition to cowardice there. <laughs> it wasn't just wimping out. You were, you were considering the small amount of money you had and making sure it went as far as possible. That's good. Yeah, I've done that a few times too. I remember uh, homecoming dance when I was a senior in high school. We went to a restaurant. It was a, there was a relatively large group of us. And yeah, we ordered calamari just so that we could all say that we'd eaten calamari. And we basically had one order of it, and we passed it around the table. And, every, I, you know, it had like eight of those little fried octopus uh, things. And, yeah, each person would have one and be like, oh, it's like this. Oh, my gosh, it's like that. And that same night, we also had escargot. See, I thought you were going to say, and that same night, we had crippling diarrhea, like my prom. <laughs> No, yeah, that was your problem. I didn't want to steal that from you, so I I let that be yours. And I'll have to admit, escargot is much more disturbing to eat than calamari was. Mm. Yeah, and years later, 
my family went on a cruise. <sighs> you know, they, the, the dinners were all paid for as part of the cruise. So you could just, you know, that you, you point at what you want on the menu. They would give you like three choices for appetizer and then, you know, three choices for main course and et cetera, et cetera, on down the line. And so, yeah, one of the times the appetizer choice was escargot. And so I got it again so that I could force all my family to eat it so that they could say that they had. And uh, everybody but my stepmom, my stepmom would not, she refused. She's like, I am not eating that crap. <laughs> That is too gross. So everybody tried it out. I was proud of my uh, family for doing that. Now I just need to get my kids to do it. I haven't tried that yet, but I might need to wait until they're a little older because it takes a certain age before you're adventurous enough to do that. Uh, have you ever been on a calamari stakeout? I haven't. You know what? Every time I hear the name calamari stakeout, I keep thinking calamari steakhouse. I would like to go to a calamari steak house, but uh, <laughs> that's just because I like steak. Okay, how about a calamari outhouse? Have you been... That doesn't sound as pleasurable. <sighs> I could probably do without that. But yeah, here's a question for you. Uh-oh. Is having a live squid stuck down your pants really the worst way to wake up? I would say yes. <laughs> you can't think of anything else that would be worse than a squid down your pants? Well, uh, I mean, it could be a porcupine, but still. Yeah, see? It could be a porcupine covered in, like, hair gel, so then it would feel kind of like a squid, but be really pointy. Mm. Or instead of a squid, it could be like a crab or something like that, that, you know, instead of just being gross and squishy, it is instead pinchy. Yeah, I, I know you have awakened many times with crabs down your trousers. But it's not the same thing as a, a live squid. Yeah. This story, it makes me think a lot of the Odyssey. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'm guessing that probably everybody that's listening was forced to read the Odyssey in high school or what passes for high school in whatever country it is that you come from. What do they call high school in the UK? Do you know? I know they call elementary school primary school there, I think. Yeah, sometimes they call it college, and, and what we call college is university there. Uh-huh. But, uh, yeah, sometimes secondary, they call it. Uh, okay, so if you're in secondary school or high school or prison reform school, whatever it was, you were probably forced to read uh, The Odyssey. That's a really common. You know, I think I may have read The Odyssey in middle school, actually. So, anyways, the situation here kind of brings to mind the part where they're sailing past, I think it's the, the Straits of Gibraltar where it's set. They're going through there, and so it's a very narrow channel to get, to get through in a boat. Then there is Scylla and Charybdis that have parked themselves there. And I can't remember which was which, but one was like a whirlpool. And the other one was like a monster with like tentacles and stuff like that coming out that could just grab sailors out of the ship and eat them. And gosh, I can't, you know, I, I think the key to get through it, it's been such a long time, I think it was seventh grade, but anyways, uh, the key to getting through it, I think was just you had to get right down the middle between the two of them. You had to be very straight. That's all I can remember. Do you remember it any better than that? I've never read a book, actually, let alone The Odyssey. Oh, oh, okay. Um, so I've no idea. <laughs> I, I thought of Moby Dick uh, when we were listening to this uh, story. Okay. Mostly because they've made movies of, ah, of Moby I see. Dick. You know, another book I've never read. They've, they've made but, mini series uh, of The Odyssey, I think. Yeah, okay. So maybe you should check that out. You, you'd be more well-read if you watched the movie of <laughs> The Odyssey. That only makes sense in, in my mind. <laughs> so Moby Dick is what you thought of more, huh? It was, but like I said, I've not read The Odyssey, so... Interesting. How does this remind you of Moby Dick? Oh, just, you know, we're on a, a, a quest to kill this... This sea monster, uh, you know, it's an obsession, in fact. You know, I have all these, all these people's lives hang in the balance, and they're actually going into, you know, dangerous waters to confront this thing. And, and 
I, I don't know. I, you were saying that the, the monster wasn't logical because <laughs> it can't if, – if, if it kept attacking ships and killing every single one that came into its territory, then people would stop going through its territory. It, you said the smart thing to do would be to let like every other ship or every th- two ships – go through and then you attack the third ship so people keep thinking well you know it's worth us risking or maybe it's gone away or whatever the deal is but see the thing with this was they wanted to go in there i got the impression they wanted to go in there and scoop up all the treasure from all the crashed ships once this creature was dead that's the impression i got the reason that there was was it a fleet or at least another ship just waiting to swoop in as soon as they killed this thing yeah they were coming in with divers and stuff like that and yeah, the the what did he say his name was again? I forgot already. My main character, Small Fry, I think. He uh he was just like, Oh crap, what do we do now? There's the Symbio Kanji How dare you in the water. And basically I think he was thinking, Crap, have we replaced one sea monster with another sea monster of a different sort? Yeah, that's a clever ending there. Although it, they, it, he didn't give us a lot of clear description of exactly what these symbio kanji quite did. Obviously, it was enough to completely incapacitate the big old giganto squid. I don't know what they would do to people if they just mesmerize you, if they eat you alive, or no, no. I, I got the impression that it was one. It was a, a like a shock, a sting, or or whatever. Oh, okay, like a little jellyfish. A little tiny jellyfish stings you. But this mass of jellyfish that's several feet wide, a human being would just die, I'm sure. I see. But this thing that's the size of a submarine, well, it uh, it goes to its happy place so that they're able to kill it. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's the impression I got. I, I You know, I, I always complain that these stories are too darn short. Um, <laughs> we probably could have gotten more detail had whoever made that rule not said they have to be really short. <laughs> yeah. Whoever that person was that made that rule must be really lazy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Two and a half years later, they're still producing these stories. <laughs> it's it's a lot of really interesting things. I wonder... I'm assuming that this isn't quite set in our world, but maybe it is. I don't know. Uh, it seems like some kind of a fantasy world. I don't know. Some kind of Panamandora or something. Hey, how dare you? Where the- We don't... Uh- we don't have whatever that uh, explosive green stuff that they used. So, yeah, that felt like science fiction or fantasy to me as well. Yeah, there was a lot of really interesting stuff in there. I don't know, man. I like that kind of stuff. That's something you don't see a ton of in fantasy writing either, is fantasy that is set on the sea. A lot of sailing. I think uh, Robin Hobb has her uh, stories about the ships, but uh, I don't think there's a whole lot others. I mean, the the, the Pirates of Penzance. What is the <laughs> Pirates of Panamandora? What is that one of Abby's called? Cowrie Catchers. Cowrie Catchers. Oh, the Guild of the. Why am I putting the pirates? Oh, it's because she always says a story of pirates in Panamandora afterwards. <laughs> she does. That's why I'm calling it the pirates of Panamandora and confusing it with the pirates of Penzance. Ooh. But I'm never, never sick at sea. I thought you were all sung out. What never? No, never. But never. Well, hardly ever. That damn kitty here is going to wake up. <laughs> Anyways, that's another example, I suppose, of uh, fantasy set on the sea. But there's not a ton of it, I don't think. Seems like that's a uh, niche. Well, can that's I ask you a question? Still pretty wide open. Yeah, sure, go ahead. I'm not saying I'll answer it, but go ahead. When Homer wrote the Odyssey, was that fantasy? Or was that supposed to be like historical truth you know what i mean like the greek mythology and all that stuff did people actually believe that or well i don't know it's hard to say i mean you would think that it was obviously fantasy but when you tie it into religion then i would guess there are people that believe religious stories literally there are people that see them as tales to teach things and there are i'm sure lots of things in between so i mean it 
they didn't have categories like that back then. It was just called uh, hieroglyphics. No, I don't know what it was. Cuneiform. What did they call uh, writing back in those days? There must have been something, some fancy word for it. Well, but, but my question is, did Homer invent a lot of this stuff? Or did he just sort of transcribe the verbal uh, stories, you know, the, the tales that had been passed on generation to generation? Something that we, the collective, the, everybody knew but but he put it in his own words and you know and made it gave it a structure and and character I, that sort of stuff is interesting to me yeah that is an interesting question i uh, don't know that i can say they call him the author of the iliad and the author of the odyssey i think the way it went was that he would just go around and say these t stories. I don't, I don't know if he actually even wrote them down himself or they were just things that people said, oh yes, Homer told this from this time and then eventually they finally wrote it down years later. I mean, I obviously, I know very little about anything, much less uh, Greek mythology and stuff. Well... You know more than me, and you just said you know very little, so holy cow. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I've heard that, you know, some people say Homer is not even a person, that all sorts of people would tell these stories, and then they would pass them along. And, and it's kind of like some people say that William Shakespeare didn't actually write all his plays, but, you know, they're, oh, no, it must have been a group of people that did this. And just published under the name William Shakespeare and crap like that. Much harder to say because Homer lived like 800 BC or so. Okay. And uh, yeah, records are a little spotty from back then. <laughs> yeah, see, I thought you had to be exaggerating that it was actually 800 BC because there's no way we would still have writings from 800 BC. But you're right. That's what it says here on Wikipedia. Yeah, that does place him around 850 BCE, which I think is the Guild of Editors, right? Isn't that what BCE stands for? <laughs> A big, are, are you sure it's from 800 BC and not 800 AD? I mean, how, how on earth could we possibly still have a writing from that long ago. I, I don't know. I think there's less writing from 800 AD than BC because AD was like right in the middle of the Dark Ages when uh, everything was a mess. When religion was forbidding people from learning to read. or Yeah, there's not okay. a whole lot from 800 AD, but 800 BC is when like the Greeks were ruling the civilized world or whatever. And so there's a lot of pottery anyways i don't know <laughs> harry pottery um a lot of fluted columns hey none of that dirty talk on our show we'll have to call it explicit again but anyhow I, i'm sure there are people out there that actually know what they're talking about if you know how the odyssey was written or how the actual pronunciation of the scylla and the and the Caribides is can you let us know on the forums or in the comments? It, it just it would be neat to find out, oh, hey, there's a ton of this kind of nautical fantasy out there. You should read this. Or, you know what this story reminded me of? Or, you know how great you guys were at that song at the beginning? You know, whatever you guys want to say <laughs> there. Um, I think uh, it would be neat if, if the forums came to life again. I'm just sadly too busy to go to the forums. So I go like once a week. And there's never anything. Nobody, they don't even play the movie quote game anymore. Uh, anyhow, sorry. Um, so the forums are out there. Give, go ahead and give the address and let people, uh, if they want to say something on the forums, I would appreciate it. Well, the address to it is doonstief.freeforums.org. And there's a link to it on the main Doonstief page. So you can just click right on it. And every story we put out, I also... Put a suggestion at the bottom that if you would like to discuss the story, come to the forum and see. Yeah, you can say what you thought of today's story or last week's or last time's story, say Uncle by Rish Outfield, or the time before story, Dear Santa by B.D. Yankovic. You know, you can talk. We can talk dogs and daughters and donuts. No big whoop. The show that we do right now 
is not scripted and it's not really structured and all that stuff. So there are times afterward that I go, oh, shoot, we should have talked about, you know, this part of the production or, oh, I forgot. I, I really wanted to bring this thing up. and But then it's done. It's it's recorded. It's over. And the forums would be a really good place to continue that or, you know, talk about the production itself. Did you hear all the sound effects that Justin put in there? I mean, some of that stuff was amazing. Did you hear how fast and rushed his production was? That was amazing in a different way. There are just, you know, so many things we could talk about that we don't because, you know, it's late at night and we don't have a director telling us, hey, hey, now you were going to talk about this. Uh, that, that That's what the forums would be good for if the forums worked like they used to. Yeah, I, and this was actually Justin's first production. It's funny because it's not the first one that we've released of his productions, but this was the first one that he put together. But it was really good Straight from the get-go, he really uh, knew what he was going for, and he did a really good job, I thought. And interestingly enough, on top of that, Justin put together the art for... You're kidding. ...the episode today, too. Yeah, he, he likes to do art. He gives me art for everything that he uh, puts together, pretty much. And sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. I know he gets irritated with me when I don't use it. We all but do. But sometimes uh, I'm... I'm going for a different uh, feel. Uh, I did include, though, last time he did a story for us and gave me art. I included it so that people could see. It was the one from Dear Santa. Oh, yes, yes. I did my art, but then With he had your one. severed head. Yes, where he had my head being stuffed into the bag. He took the caricature from our website and he made it all beat up and bloody and black eyed and stuff. And he put it in the bag and had Santa there holding the bag. I thought that was pretty funny. So I had to include it. Well, th yes, Justin, thank you. I think we've mentioned before, but it's worth mentioning six more times, that he has all of the excitement and optimism for the show that we had in 2008. Yeah, he's really, uh, he's really uh, goes after it. It's nice because I know that I can send him something and he'll get right on it and have it done really quickly. It's nice to have somebody like that. Because, yeah, I mean, like, for example, Marshall Latham asked me to uh, do a little thing for his podcast the other day. Well, sorry, the other day the other he year. asked me again to do it. And, yeah, I don't know. It's, it was six months it took me to get it for him. And it was like a paragraph I had to read. So that's how lame I am compared to Justin Charles. Well, yeah, it's uh, maybe we should steer this boat uh into those particular rocks right now and just talk about that. Let's address that. <laughs> okay. Um, life. You know, generally it's not good to steer a boat into rocks. No, it's it's not good. But, you know, that's what we do every month here on the Dune Steve. <laughs> we find that it's difficult a lot of times to uh, get together, to podcast, to edit those podcasts, to post the podcast, to write, to edit our writing, to put our writing out there for somebody to buy, to create episode art or cover art for our writing these are things because it's their 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 passions for us because we're, we're not being paid for it because it's you know self-expression that we have to fit in there in our spare time or or on our downtime or late at night such as now and that's gotten very very difficult i, I mean I, we complain about it i complain about it all the time uh, but all these things that are are I want to say that they're worth doing, but sometimes it's really hard to remember that. It's hard to, to, to think that they're worth doing when there's not a paycheck attached or there's not tons of adulation and applause or Parsec awards or even comments or emails that it's going good. You and I are both people whose engines run down real quick uh -huh. or our, our motors, whatever you want to call it, and... There are people out there that they don't need positive comments or, or, you know, somebody patting them on the back or saying you're a good boy for that engine to run. I mean, there are people who's sometimes when somebody criticizes them or whatever, their engine runs hotter, harder, and they work harder and hotter and they're going to prove those guys wrong or, you know, they, they're fueled by this negativity. Uh, you and I, we're not like that. It's a, it's a spanner that gets pushed into the works anytime. Any little thing 
can derail us or, or, or do you know, some kind of mechanical equivalent to our engine. Speaking of being derailed, what is a spanner anyways? I mean, I've heard that mentioned. A spanner is a wrench. It's a, you know, the wrench it's in a the wrench. works. Yeah. So why do they call it a spanner? <laughs> That's just the old English term for it. A I'm spanner sorry. in the works, you know. I won't stand for that anymore. <laughs> okay. Oh, so, oh, wait, did I, did I derail us? No. Did I? I, I mean, I was, I was going on and on, and it was fine for you to interrupt. Did I throw a spanner into the works there? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, so anyhow, just, it, it's been hard for us to keep podcasting and keep writing and not be fat. I'm ridiculously fat right now, uh, for me at least. So I tried to go for a run before we recorded today, and I was just like, why would anybody do this? Why? Holy cow, Why? I don't care how pretty that girl dressed as Laura Croft was. I'm never doing this again. <laughs> and you, you know, you get up like at six o'clock in the morning, which I wouldn't be able to do for any girl dressed as Laura Croft. And then you run. It's amazing. If a doctor told me you will die tomorrow unless you get up and, and run, uh, you know, I would I would pass away in my sleep because, uh, you know. Okay. Anyway, I'm sorry, sorry, but you know, it's a new year and we try and uh, kickstart, if you will, the, that engine and get it going again, uh, you know, setting new goals and, and, and trying to do better than we did the year before. And I, I just thought maybe we could talk about that briefly. You and I went to a convention over the weekend. And usually when I go to a convention, I go to panels and stuff, I'll hear something and it'll, it'll fire me up and I'll be like, okay, I'm going to get home and, and we're going to do this or we're going to do better than we did or some outlandish thing I come up with that we never actually do. You know how these things are. Uh-huh. So did you, did that happen to you at this? I mean, you met Laura Croft, so that was good. I did. And it was enough to make you want to run. Well, yes, I, and I also went out and bought a costume so that I could cosplay. Really? Because I, I just wanted to be like her. Anyhow, I'm sorry, this is an overshare. It was uh, it a Lara Croft costume? Please tell me it wasn't. It was, and dude, <laughs> those short shorts, which I was running in today, they really ride up. They're constrictive. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, we went to this convention, and it was the first one that you and I had gone to together in a long time, I thought. I mean... We went to the disastrous one last year where we didn't get to see anything or do anything. And then we just <laughs> stood out. my and... keys in the car. Yeah. Oh, that was a good one. But this one, you and I... I made sure when we went to this one that I had my keys. Yeah, yeah you should even, like, make a spare. But anyhow, uh, we went to as many writing-related panels as we could. And in the back of my mind, I was hoping that somebody would say something. And I would stand up and be like, yes, I will do it. 2015 will be my year, 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 I year, believe. year, 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 year. And, that, you know, that didn't really happen. But, uh, you know, just being around you and you have writing goals and uh, I have writing goals and one of us is writing right now. It's, it's, it's fun to have somebody else that has the same goals as you or, or is, in, is trying to do the same thing. And there were a couple of things in the panels that they said that, that I liked. Anyway, do you want to talk anything about that? Or, or, or have I just talked us out? I don't think you've talked us out yet. I'm, I'm sure you're probably just barely getting started. <laughs> what did you take out of these? Did, I mean, did you get that nugget, that thing that got you excited? Was there something that made you stand up and yell, I believe? No, no, there wasn't, except for in the back of my mind, I was thinking that maybe in 2015, I will finally write a novel, you know? Yeah. Th maybe maybe I can do it. And, and I've been kicking that around. And I know you keep talking about NaNoWriMo. And if it were any other month, you have written a novel by now. And in fact, on your blog, you were going to do a, a chapter a month, I think, and, until your novel was done. And you don't even yeah. have the excuse of moving or... Uh, having a new child to have derailed you there, but... Well, the child is still new, unfortunately. But yeah, I do need to get back on that. I, I've recently thought that I need to concentrate, I should say, on writing a novel. Because when it comes down to it, you and I have written enough words to have written a novel. They're just not all connected 
and part of the same story to make them a novel. But uh, yeah, something that one of the people in one of the panels that we went to was talking about a new style, a new kind of novel, I guess, that's becoming more and more popular that I guess they call it a commuter novel. I'm not sure why. Maybe someone who flies on a plane and reads a novel in that amount of time can be considered a commuter or something like that. But anyways, they're short novels. They said between 50 and 70,000 words is what they would call a commuter novel. And one of the uh, authors uh, talked about how, you know, in the old days, he's a fantasy author and he's like, you know, you write this story and it's 120,000 words and it's, you know, 500 pages long or more. And that's just like what they expect of a fantasy novel writer. What they expect did. Right, right. That's what was expected of a fantasy novel writer. You had to write this gigantic novel. But these days, you know, you can charge... They made the uh, example of like a 12,000 word novelette. You can charge like four ninety nine for something like that. And people will pay that. But you write a 120,000 word novel. You can't charge $49 get 10 times the amount of money for the 10 times the amount of words. So writing a shorter novel is better business-wise, I guess. And I wrote a story last year that was 25,000 words long. I think I could easily, you know, write one that's 50,000. Not like easily, easily, but that 25,000 word story took me a month and a half, so three months I could probably write a 50,000 word commuter novel if I just worked at it. It's something I think that I could do if I really put my mind to it. And I have said before that I know you could do it even though you claimed to not be able to in the past. Yeah, that's been a stumbling block just in my mind whether I can do it or not. And one of the panels that we went to, there was a, a fantasy author who sold a lot of stuff. He said that uh, you have to decide what your character wants and then create obstacles preventing him or her from getting what they want. And he said, if there are no obstacles and your character gets what they want, then it's a short story. But for a novel, you have to just keep coming up with new obstacles and new things preventing him or her from getting there. Yes, yeah, the try-fail cycle. And that, that resonated with me because I thought, well, I, you know, I know how to write a short story. I've written an obscene number of short stories. Maybe all I need to do is just keep coming up with obstacles and, and eventually that will become a novel. And uh, what you were saying before just just doing it keeping at it until it's done uh, it might have been the same writer it might have been a different one said that when he was young somebody said well how do you write a novel and it said well you take a, a blank piece of paper and you put it in your typewriter and you fill it with words and then you do it 300 more times and i thought i can do that can't i can can i do that so I don't know. It wasn't like I was jumping around, like, you know, running up the steps in Philadelphia, like, you know, Rocky Balboa or anything like that after this. But in the back of my mind, I was like, I think I can do that. And that's better than nothing. Yeah, that really is something. Yeah. Giving you that feeling that you can do that. Because, I mean, it's what they say. What wasn't it you that was saying you were reading on Dean Wesley Smith's site and he was doing something about short stories and he's like questions you should ask yourself if you want to write short stories first of all can i write a novel instead if the answer is yes then do that because they sell way better than short stories nobody gives a crap about short stories so don't even bother but if you can't do a novel well then i guess a short story is better than nothing <laughs> He just has this dismissive tone, doesn't he, with everything. <laughs> well, if you're gonna suck, and I guess you better do it right. And so I think, 
you were thinking, maybe I need to write novels. And now all of a sudden you think, maybe I can write a novel. So that's something. Yeah, I, I wrote a very, very long short story in 2014. that They're I called long stories. What? <laughs> you can't call them short stories anymore. You just have to call it a long story. Well, what did you call it? You call it... You, there's, there's some made-up word that you have for every yes, 10,000 yes. extra words. So I, I think yours made it to novella length. Uh, yeah, in the back of my mind, I think, well, you know, novella is just, I think, the step before novel. Uh, maybe, you know, if I had just pushed it a little harder or came up with more obstacles or fleshed out the world more. I, I don't know what it is because I've never written a novel. I would have had a novel. I, I, we'll, we'll find out if I can do it in this new year. Yeah, I think, I think it would be worth giving a try. Did you get anything out of the convention? Anything other than fatter? <sighs> well, I definitely got fatter since we parked right next to the freaking Carl's Jr., I tried so hard to not uh, give in and go there, too, but no. Uh, one thing that I did find interesting, there was one panel that we were at, and somebody asked a question about collaborations and how the folks that were up there have managed to make that work. And there, somebody said that, and I thought this was super interesting because I thought it would work perfectly for you and I, um, they said that what you need to do is you get together, get in a room or, or you drive on a long road trip or whatever it is that you do that gets you guys stuck in the same area. And then you go through it and work the story out and throw out the ideas and talk about it and everything. But the most important thing is that you have to have one person who is in charge, basically, of the collaboration. So this person has the final say. It seemed like that would work perfectly for us because you're the kind of person who that wants to have the final say and I'm the kind of person who who is happy to, you know, throw in their two cents worth and and be able, you know, as long as we're hey, you know, we worked it out together and I'm not going to throw my hands up and quit on the project because it didn't go the way I hoped it would, but I don't know, maybe somebody else might do that. So that person is the one that should be the person in charge. And it seems like that might, and it makes me want to try to do a collaboration with you again with that in mind and really try and work on that. Which panel was that where they talked about the collaboration? Because I, my, in my spotty memory, it was a very useless panel, which was bad writing advice. <laughs> that was the one, yeah. And they just threw out all sorts of idiotic advice they had heard from various people like, uh, you know, never just say somebody said. You always, an adverb is your friend. And, that, and they never talked about why these were bad advice. And it wasn't until the very end when somebody had a question and he's like, hey, can you just shut up with all this stupid bad advice thing just for a minute? Just humor me for a second, please, <laughs> and answer a question straight. How do you do collaboration? And suddenly, at the very end of the panel, there was something useful. Yeah, it, it was that one. Because everything else in the panel had been just, let's tell jokes, let's be amusing. Sometimes that's what people are doing in all the panels when it comes down to it. There was one panel that was, nobody was doing that, and it was totally awful and eventually i was like okay let's just go it was only halfway over but i'm like let's go to this other panel because this one sucks but yeah telling jokes seems to be uh i guess both good and bad when it comes to uh panels like that well you know uh as i said before there's a lot of things that are hard to do and you have to keep motivating yourself to do it and trying to be not as fat is difficult, you know, trying to eat right or exercise or, I don't know, all of these things that you skinny people do. You need some kind of motivation or inspiration or competition or, I don't know, there, there needs to be something else like that. And the doing steep is like that as well. You know, it's something that you and I both enjoy doing, but it's not at the top of our priority list anymore. There's just so many other things that we do. Uh, just you and me getting together and doing this episode... I think this is like two weeks late from when we first planned on getting together and doing this episode. That's definitely true. 
And just to get as far as we did, this has been uh, difficult too. We had to do it very differently than we normally did. And I think we would have done it at least three days ago. Well, you had to work, or I had to work one day. And then so that we could go to the convention, you had to work an extra day. And then it was your daughter's birthday. And then the child had had a nap. And so you couldn't get him to go to sleep until very, very late. And then the next night, because you had stayed up all night with the kid trying to get him to go to sleep, you fell asleep trying to get the kid to go to sleep and woke up at the wee hours of the morning on the floor. You know what I mean? It's just like a whole row of dominoes of things that just keep falling to prevent us from doing any Dune Steve episodes. Yeah, waking up on the floor was not good. Let me tell you, my back did not appreciate me that day. But, you know, we do what we can. We do our best and we we try and make it work. And sometimes there's just more uh, getting in the way. You do your best to work around it. Heck, if you you try really hard, maybe you'll have a novel written by the end of the year. You know, you never know. Maybe a collaboration, too. Yeah, it, it seems like collaborating with somebody should make a book half the work instead of twice the work. You know, it's just like if I have a friend help me move into my apartment, it will take half the time. That just seems logical, but we should talk more to other people about collaborations. I, I remember when we did uh, Last Contact, we said on there, if you've ever done a collaboration, how do you do it? And people didn't know. <laughs> Everybody's uh, got some ideas, I think, but nobody really knows. Probably even people that do it. I don't know. That's one thing somebody said when they were talking about collaborations that, oh, what you do is one person writes the story and then the next person does second draft or something. And I just thought, oh, count me in as the guy that does the second draft. I'm all over that. <laughs> Did somebody really say that? Yeah. It's just like one person moves everything into the U-Haul truck and then unloads everything in the new apartment And then the other guy (laughs) watches to make sure that everything is put in the right room. The other guy just has to drive down the street to the other house. (laughs) That's his part. Okay, we we can make comparisons on that. That, Oh, that's that's not a collaboration, man. That's just, you know, having an editor or something like that. And most of the time you don't see the editor's name on the byline. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, that's that's rough, dude. Can you imagine if you got the short end of that stick? (laughs) And you had to split the money with that person? Yeah, I don't think that would work out as well for me. I wouldn't call that a a very fair uh, collaboration. But, you know, we'll find a way to make it work. I think we did pretty well the first time. And uh, with this little advice, I think we might be able to do even better. So, ladies and gentlemen, what you can look forward to from the Dune Steve. 2015. A novel and a collaboration. Awesome. But no new episodes of The Dune, Steve, sadly. <laughs> Won't be time for that. No, we, we should try again to put out more episodes and thank people for uh, listening and wanting us to put out an episode. Just, it's hard. I, if we had Justin Charles's fortitude and, and ambition, yeah, you'd be on our like fourth or fifth episode of the new year already. Most definitely. All right. Well, I think our show has run its course today. It seems like Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely, man. Uh, It ran its course midway through the song on your verse. (laughs) But uh, thank you, Austin Malone. And that sounds like a a character in an action movie in the 1980s that maybe Kurt Russell would play Austin Malone or something like that. Yeah. Thank you for writing that story, for entering the contest, and, and being patient enough to wait years to hear your work on screen. Not on screen, on... Air? Where is he hearing the words? On air, yes. Okay, and yeah, thanks again to uh, Justin Charles for all the work that he put into this. Here it is, your first production on the air, but not the first production on the air. Anyways, thanks for producing the story and for doing the art. Yeah, that was good stuff. All right, well, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield, uh, reminding you that a rectal thermometer made of cactus is the second worst way you can wake up in the morning not nearly as bad as a squid a live one down your pants your mountain's waiting everybody get on your way why not good night
a good night. Thanks for listening. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. Take two. We'll have to start soon. Get this show. I blew it, didn't I? Here I am singing. Just like an old pro. Damn it, that's not the line. (laughs) What was that? What was what? Was it the world's grandest fart? No, I don't don't know. All I could hear was a bucket of water being dumped. How often does that happen? A lot. Like once a minute. Really? Yes. I wonder if it's getting interference from like my speakers or once a minute. Sometimes I feel like I have to shout over the top of it when I realize that you don't hear it. (laughs) Is there anything else you want to talk about about the story or about the winners or whatever? I I thought we would talk a little bit about the convention we went to and whether uh, we should write more and work harder. And the one thing that I got out of or the thing that I, I I kept thinking about while I was running today, besides, how come I can't breathe? <laughs> Here I am singing, just like Maroon 5, it's a song I don't like. But if it means the show, oh, sh- that's the part. <laughs> All right, we're starting over. Okay. Okay, well, let's invite the listeners to... Uh, interact with us on the forums and let us know and you know put right what once went wrong they don't even play the movie quote game anymore my niece was watching mean girls in the other room and i heard a really funny quote and i said oh i'm gonna go online and find out the exact wording of that quote and that will be mine and nobody knows it nobody cares uh yes the forums are. i'll have to admit i haven't seen mean girls so it's got that girl you like in it wait does it it does one of the mean She's girls. She's w- the meanest of the mean girls. But not Lindsay Lohan. See, I'm not really a big fan of Lindsay Lohan. Oh, that's too bad. That was during that brief time when she was actually really good. Yeah. She was a talented actress there. Before she went off the rails. Did you see Freaky Friday? I did see Freaky Friday. She was really good in that. She showed a ton of, of uh, talent, which is all gone now, but it's all right. <laughs> It has got so hard. I don't think I'm on key right there. Okay, going back. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it would be worth giving a try. And oh, there he is. It was either him or the screaming of a banshee, man. Yeah, they're pretty similar. So, so I don't know. We do have a bunch of dogs that live next door that do some crazy howling kind of stuff. So it could have been that too. I don't know. Doesn't matter. But uh, but if if it means that. This is the hardest part. Ate it right there at that line. If I hadn't tripped over it. But if it means. And now we're going to have to do the whole damn thing over because we can (laughs) never find where we're at. Okay. Today I was trying to record a chapter during the day, which is always a mistake, but my, my nephew was at school. And yeah, there was a dog that was just barking like, you know, two houses away. And I just thought, if I killed that dog, would the police understand that I was trying to record? Or would I be punished for that? I think you might get punished. Ignore how you smell before... uh, Damn it. You had it. That was good. We'll start over one more time. From the beginning, really? Sure. (laughs) Sure. I we're think, so I, close. I think Wait, we, we can... don't know if we're doing four or three. But I know <laughs> pretty soon. Okay, want to start over? Tonight I'll make break my blood flow. Damn it, there's a really so hard to stand here. Ignore how you smell, but for our show's fans. The Dune Steve! The Dune Steve! Tonight we're gonna record the Dune Steve. You're scaring me a little bit. The, the Dune, Dune Steve. Steve. Behind us. 
And when the doing Steve is good to go, tonight we're gonna do our best show. Record the doing Steve like a mofo, and tonight our podcast with this old ho. Hey, wait, what? I'm <laughs> sick. <laughs> Was it supposed to be me still going down? Yeah. I thought you were supposed to go there. Ignore how you smell, but for our show's fans, I know I would go through hell. That damn part. All behind us, behind us. What was that? And when the dusty. Okay, should we do it one more time or is that good? Sure, we'll do it one more time. Can't hurt. (laughs) Whoa. Whoa. You know what? What? It's 320. We should get going, actually. Okay. Let it go. Let it go. Come on, do it in the Schwarzenegger voice. Can do the Schwarzenegger voice. Say that perfect girl is gone. That perfect girl is gone. Let it go. I don't care what the Something what you're going say. to say. The Maybe you should come in first and then bring the chair. Anyway. The call never bothered me anyway. Okay. <clears throat> Look at her. She's scared of her mind. Calamari Steakout by your mom. Who is it by? Austin Malone. Austin Malone. Having a live squid thrust down. Oh. Wow. What, what was that? What? Uh. <laughs> wow. That was a loud one. Uh, I'm already having trouble reading them in the first sentence. Well, let's make it bigger. That's what she said. Think, of, think about Anna Hathaway. That's a lot of whales to fit under your belt, sir. How large are these people on your team? Or are they those little smallest whales? Is there a small whale? There are smaller whales, of course, but like an orca is a whale. And it's relatively small compared to a blue whale, anyways. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry to waste your time, even sir. Even your smile, even you're small compared to a blue whale, sir. That's true. And they call me big, so that's kind of weird. Grunt as you hold the trap door open. Oh, yeah. Her stable tresses. Sable tresses. Her sable tresses. Her stable dresses streamed in. Her sable tresses streamed in the breeze as she glanced in my direction. We separated, and I paused at the base of the mainmast. Mainmast? Do I have to say it like You're a... You're American, say it right. But us sailors say that. It's a sailor thing. It's different than Americans. It's mm, sailor I thing. I don't think you're a sailor. I think Mizzenmast. <laughs> the poop deck. The, the thing. I've forgotten all the fun. But I remember mizzen. I always liked the mizzen. The mizzenmast. Although they probably said mizzenmast or something. Of Sidar. Sidar? Sadar? Let's say Sidar so it doesn't sound like radar. And Faistia? Faistia? It's that you choose whichever you prefer. Faistia or Faistia? I think Faistia probably sounds more Greek based. Faistia and Sadar? No, Sidar you wanted, right? Up to you. I think Sidar. Doesn't okay. rhyme with anything. Sidar is the female half of the one power in the uh, Robert Jordan books, but it's spelt slightly different. I think it's S A I. Sidar. And old Sly could feed at his leisure. And old Sly could feed at his leisure. You know, leisure sounded better. Yeah, but I'm not saying leisure. But it just sounded better. I hate it. I was able to think, instead, about my share of the sh... About my share of the sh... Damn it. 
shipwreck salvage about my share of the (laughs) share shipwreck salvage is causing me trouble (laughs) i turned the rock and said and did that eyebrow thing on the deck below the crew was cheering i guess that's the end that last paragraph does not belong Symbio kanji. You're a symbio kanji. Stay. Bark, bark, quack, tail. Good boy. Good boy. Nice one, 08OT.